Welcome everyone to Cooper Hewitt's National Design Week celebrating its 20th year. Today's Winter Salon 2020 shares the National Design Award winners from this year with all of you in 20 20 minute programs. I'm Kara McCarty, Director of Curatorial at Cooper Hewitt, and it is my honor to share today's panel uh, with you. We have Patricia Moore, winner of the Design Mind Award, and Pinar Guvenk and Christina Malin of Open Style Lab, winners of Emerging Design Award. And this is the first year we have offered the Emerging Design Award category. The title of today's talk is Why Inclusive Design Matters. This is a very exciting and important and meaningful topic to me. And before we launch this conversation, I just want to say that we often say here at the museum, design matters, design is an agent of change, design improves lives. But to me, there is no better description of that than the type of work that today's designers are doing. And it's, I just have to thank them all, congratulate them for winning the award, and also to say that I think it's very much a sign of our times that finally the type of work that they've been devoting their careers to is finally getting the important recognition that it deserves. So thank you, um, and let's get started. <clears throat> I um, it was about when I was starting my career in the early 1980s. I remember reading an article in the New York Times that has really been indelible. And it was about this young woman who was 26 who disguised herself as a woman in her 80s. And she embarked on an experiment um, living in New York City. That woman, <clears throat> that young woman was Patricia Moore. And I remember the article was accompanied by a photograph, a very large photograph of her crossing a street hunched over in New York City. And I, first of all, think that that was really risky, courageous of you. And I would just um, love to have you describe that experience a bit and um, what inspired you to do that. Well, you know, Carol, it wasn't so much an inspiration that came in a moment. You know, the, there wasn't white lightning and bells going off and um, anything, you know, where I just had a recollection of, oh, I must do this thing. But rather, I think I'd been trained from the moment of birth uh, to be aware of my elders. I'm from Buffalo, New York. I come from a very small Irish family. And my friends in my early years were all my neighbors. And they were primarily elder widows. And I was just their baby doll. And I learned early on that there was nothing wrong with spending a happy afternoon with a neighbor who just wanted to squeeze the stuffing out of me and give me jelly jam, bread, and all sorts of treats, and, and just talk with me and tell me stories. And it was, it was just heaven on earth. And I think because I did have such loving relationships within my own home with my grandparents, it never occurred to me as I matured and went through school and started here in New York with Raymond Lowy's office, that we would exclude our elders, but we did. They were never part of a design brief. And so when that kismet moment came where I met Barbara Kelly, who was the makeup designer for Saturday Night Live, doing prosthetics, turning Belushi into a cone head and all these things, I asked her if she could make me look like an elder, and she said, sure, you know, she's from Brooklyn. <laughs> And she was matter-of-fact about it. I was quite innocently matter-of-fact about it. And it only took about two weeks before my first appearance, which was at a conference in Ohio State of architects who were planning to design residences for our elders. And I went as an elder, and what I found was nobody paid any attention to me. And these were the informed gatekeepers and it wasn't until the second day of the conference when I came out as myself that people said, oh, Patty, you missed the first day. It was fabulous. And then someone said, you know, there was an old lady here. Maybe we should have asked her some questions. <laughs> and then we told them it was me. And the whole tone of the conference, the meeting changed to focus on 
where are our prejudices coming from? What is this all about? What is the exclusion of design all about? So through that whole experience, I realized I had tumbled into my path for my entire career. So now nearly 50 years of fighting for inclusivity, and we're still at it. So do you think that if you were to embark on that same experiment today, that you would encounter a lot of what you experienced before? Do you th or do you think things have changed? I mean, what has changed? Well, things have changed significantly, but globally, the numbers of elders have risen at such startling rates. We have governments and communities unable to care properly beyond family structure. So I just spent um, 10 years uh, before the, this current um, presidency making sure that the people in China could have resources for caring for elders. And it was an initiative from our government looking at actually the impact of the one-child policy, which, by the way, I have to say is a meeting you know no women attended. Uh, there is simply some types of governance that are so clearly wrong because of the exclusion of the female voice. And I say that as not just a proud feminist, but a realist. Noah was right. You have to have two of everything on the ark or someone's going to get left out. And so this work really taught us that it wasn't just China that had a problem and a critical problem, but countries all over the world are going to struggle with the presence of elders and the lack of what we call elder care, which really is just looking at design sensitivity for the lifespan. We all of us deserve a high quality of life, and that necessitates appropriate design. Yes, I read this, um, this really staggering statistic recently that in the United States, every day 10,000 people turn 65. Wow. If you think about mm -hmm. that and you multiply it by like 40 or 50, that's a town. And it is the white elephant in front of us mm -hmm. that um, I'd love to get back to in this discussion because it really is, I mean, it's a, it's a topic that we're all facing and I don't think we're really prepared for. And I, I know you all have something to say about it, but I'd love to just hear a little bit about your um, background at Open Style Lab. What, um, what inspired you to start Open Style Lab? Well, Open Style Lab first started as a social service project at MIT, and really seeing how technology and science could only go so far, but like at hospitals, for example, you wouldn't even see people like being able to dress themselves. And uh, Grace, who's our other uh, board member, um, she was um, quick to realize, well, okay, we're doing this, but like, how? why don't we have fashion designers or any other designers on board to manage that? So uh, we created this structure of teaming up with engineers, uh, designers, and occupational or physical therapists to co-create with people with disabilities. And um, seeing the lack of awareness around it, uh, we moved Open Style Lab to New York City in 2017, which is, I guess, when I met Christina. And, um, you know, my, um, on my day-to-day, -day, I manage an architecture and design studio outside of OSL, and I was appalled by my own lack of awareness around the subject. You know, in architecture, we talk about ADA compliance, but inclusion is far greater than, uh, you know, just accessibility in buildings. And um, I grew up in Turkey when, I guess, uh, in a developing country, inclusive design is not even a topic to discuss. And um, I was amazed how, you know, growing up, I would, I never perceived something as a design fault, but always as, oh, you know, he's not able to wear it, or I'm not able to do it. Like, it was always like, you know, blaming ourselves and having something not work. Um, so meeting Christina actually is, um, was very eye-opening to me, and you can tell your story, I guess, like joining. Yeah, so about eight years ago, my arms started to become paralyzed. They still actually don't know why. So I couldn't really join an advocacy group. I tried going to the White House, talking to Trump, trying to get things changed for people with disabilities. 
but then really realized that I could possibly make a lot more impact by creating products and advertising that are inclusive of all. And my background is I work at a Wonderman Thompson, it's the world's largest agency, and none of the brands were talking about inclusive design. So one day I thought I would have to quit my job because I couldn't put my coat on by myself and I lived alone and had no use of my arms and I was referred to Open Style Lab. And from there, um, became an active board member with Pinar and Grace because I felt like I could really make a change from making these physical products that allow people to live their everyday lives. And then what I do at Open Style Lab is I help them market it. M there's actually more redheads in ads than people with disabilities. There's more fashion lines for dogs than people with disabilities, but one fifth of the world identify as having a disability, and it's a eight tr trillion dollar market. So it's really just kind of bringing that awareness um, and getting Open Style Lab's voice out there has been so important and, and kind of what I've done on my day to day. But it really is life changing. I used to feel like I didn't matter and I was broken, and now I feel like I'm a part of the team changing really how design is done. So how do we get to the CEOs? Um, I'm starting to see little cracks in that area where there is interest, but um, how do we get to the CEOs to really embed this, not, I mean, not even just in the products, but just making their whole um, work environment um, that extends to just our, re our, our environment more accessible, more inclusive? I guess she said it, dollars, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, uh, we, we were talking about this earlier. You would uh, accept, uh, like, expect for them to be like, oh, yeah, you know, this is common sense or human rights. We should be doing this. But in business, it doesn't work like that, really. You only get their interest when you start talking about how big of a market that is that this is that is untapped. And um, I think well, whenever we go into more like corporate consulting, we suggest, you know, first we should come in and sort of give workshops to the team to get everybody on board and have the same level of uh, awareness on this. And then we move on to, okay, what do you want to do? What is the research that we need to do together? And what are we developing? But really having all interests aligned or even having the departments talk to each other, that takes forever. So I think most of the corporations see the value of teaming up with more of a lean team that could help guide them. Uh, but having them take action, I think, takes forever. But, you know, dollars interest them. So let's back up a moment because um, the word inclusive design is um, not something that a lot of people really understand. So I'd love to hear from you, Patty, what, how you define inclusive design. Well, when in the 70s, when we were trying to just brand what my philosophy was emerging to be, um, we were using universal design. So Ron Mace at North Carolina State University as an architect had, had used it. I actually had used it on a housing project I did as a senior project at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And when we met one another, we became fast friends because I had always argued we need to have the architects on our side, and he always said we have to have product designers. And so, you know, clearly um, Noah's Ark was filling up nicely. So, um, and broadening the scope of the family, it it did become very frustrating when you mentioned the ADA. I actually felt my heart sort of flop because, even though I was one of the authors of the bill. I felt it was one of the worst uh, disappointments of my career that we actually were having to mandate a law that said every citizen in this country deserves access to every community and opportunities for jobs. And some days I just put my head on the pillow and think that's how ridiculous we are. If we don't have a law, we don't do just the right thing. So I, I'm thrilled, though, to see Gen Z especially and the younger millennials totally understanding this need for universality, inclusivity, and recognizing how plain stupid it is to exclude anyone from any opportunity, either as a consumer or as a fellow human on the planet, to have the best life that they can lead. Anybody from you want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of how I get CEOs to really act 
and, and get people to talk about is they really don't know what inclusive design is. So mm -hmm. I email them in the header, it says the $8 trillion market you're missing, question mark. And then I give them the, an example of what inclusive design is. And that's really kind of how I'm able to get, you know, people to actually care and understand because, you know, a lot of people don't know what inclusive design is. And, and that's definitely an issue because it's not in the curriculum today. Well, when we're looking at a future that is today, it's $89,000 a year median price to place a loved, a loved one into assisted living. Um, in some parts of the country, it's double that. And now that we have so many people with power who have elder parents facing that end of life, uh, they're waking up to the fact that this is completely wrong. So in interior design, we've been doing aging in place. We need to rebrand that, it's a terrible phrase, but it speaks to the fact that all of us at least deserves to have a nest of our own and then a place where we can stay for the entirety of our life and it shouldn't be a pseudo hospital. Right, so the, the, as I said earlier, this is like the elephant, the white elephant in the room and uh, we're spending a lot of money, resources to keep people al alive as long as possible. Um, but we're really not adjusting our cities to, to accommodate that. So what would you say would be the next two or three steps if a, a com if to, for us to start really moving and acting on this to, to become more um, accommodating for this huge wave of older adults? Well, I think we've all touched on the ed um, edification and the education piece. I'm surprised that we have to go back and study this yet again and introduce it yet again. But I would go as early as possible in schooling um, to literally preschools. I've, I've lectured at Google preschools on what I do. And the, the students just are so enamored because they love their grandmother and they love their granddaddy and, and they can't wait to go home and tell everyone they met a lady who used to be 85. <laughs> and you know you can imagine, they're wondering, what are they teaching these kids? But um, it, it's so important for us to be edified and I think that really is going to be the primary step. It's already too late when a family has a crisis mm -hmm. and uh, certainly as we all look to our own families, um, my mother's end of life came after a fall, and I'll make myself very emotional. Stephen Colbert, whom I admire, had uh, Sir Paul McCartney on recently, and he did um, a piece, I guess his writers maybe weren't aware of how cruel it was to create children book covers that showed, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up jokes. And I really thought we had gotten past that, and I still have to calm myself enough to write to to Stephen about how wrong that was. Um, but you could see Sir Paul McCartney was looking at him like uh, he, he wasn't pleased. I'm, I'm certain of it. I, you could just read his face. So um, sorry, that got me a little emotional. No, but, to ha but to have your own mother die from a fall and then to turn on the television and see that, it's, it's disheartening at the very least. And I think one out of three people 65 or older no. have falls. Yes. So uh, another staggering statistic. Mm -hmm. um, so what, um, just as we just have a couple more minutes left, I would, and we've got a lot of students I can see here, what advice would you give to young students today? I mean, I think sort of, I guess, being the emergent designer <laughs> ourselves, um, we've benefited a lot from strategic collaborations and really finding your people and to, collabor to collaborate with. I mean, you're always only as good as your team. Like, this is given. You can only achieve so much on your own. And having a diverse group of people, a diverse team really helps you get far. And whether that you have an idea or a product design or you know a mission, whatever that is, you cannot make impact on your own. So I think you know our generation is very keen on social impact, but it happens with the most tedious tasks maybe and with a lot of uh, work with a great group of people. And another thing that I, is really important, and I, and I see it in a lot of design work today, particularly the areas that you're all working in, is really working with the users. That is, it's a game changer. And um, I think that we're seeing a lot better products because of it, and we are, we are learning many of the new, their needs because of it. 
Yeah, I, everyone says, well, I don't know someone that's disabled. I have literally gone on my Instagram and say, does anyone have a friend with cerebral palsy? I need to talk to them. And I get 10 replies. So it's really putting yourself out there to get to know um, people that are not like you. And I think that's probably one of the biggest advice I would say. Yesterday we met with students and I wore a t-shirt that was the design of a little boy from Florida and you might recall this summer this very sad story that it was at his school the day you wore your favorite college team colors and he didn't have a t-shirt so he tried making one and he was bullied. Long story short, the t-shirt I was wearing was one of 100,000 that have been sold. Uh, the funds are being raised for an anti-bullying app that started and then uh, the University of Tennessee, the school that he was trying to support, is giving him a complete education for free once he gets out of the fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and I was explaining to the students that I was meeting with how important it was to recognize now the power of design to be an ambassador for change. So in the 70s when I trained and when I began my career, that wasn't our focus, but I'm so grateful today that it is because literally every moment of our day is about design. Well, that's, I can't think of a more poignant way to end and also end on the topic of empathy. Thank you very, very much. It's been a real honor to, to be with you.